Our next speaker, Ayachi Nakata from the University of Reading. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, before I start, a couple of uh, uh, things. Um, just manage your expectations. Unlike all these fascinating talks that people are giving regarding the project and so forth, my talk doesn't involve any uh, project as such. But instead, what I'm trying to do is to try to present a uh, perspective uh, called organizational semiotics, which I use um, in my day-to-day -day life to try to make sense of things. So my background, uh, although in this NERC uh, network, uh, my background is in uh, engineering, nuclear engineering, uh, and then later on I did a PhD in artificial intelligence back in the 1990s, so eight years ago, and the work as computer scientist for a while before I joined the business school. So I don't know why I'm doing a business school, but it sort of shows that the uh, and making sense of technology uh, is a key part of our uh, everyday life. And I think uh, even for the natural environment com community, I think we had some talks around development of communities and, and development of people. I think that element uh, needs to be considered uh, in, in a broader context. So I hope this will be not that uninteresting to this community, but I'll talk about aligning people, politics, and technology from the organizational semiotics perspective. Now, if you know what organized semiotics is, then you can leave the room because you'll probably get bored by my talk. But if you are very really interested, what I'm uh, trying to focus on uh, is, again, sense making. And uh, things I will cover include problem with things called misalignment. Essentially, this uh, mis uh, not aligning the design intentions and then the actual technology implementation, which might potentially cause problems. And uh, also uh, looking at some of the, the concepts around disruptive technologies so that we can make sense of why disruptive technology happens and, and how that's introduced and how they're resolved. And I'll do all this from a certain so organizational semiotics point of view, which is a, um, a type of um, based on semiotics, which is a study of signs, <clears throat> and uh, try to apply that in a very broad sense to the understanding of organizations and uh, involvement of technology in organizations. So um, we'll talk about uh, using some techniques from the organizational semiotics to address some of these issues. Um, in this community, we haven't been talking about it, but in all the symposiums and books that I've been attending in the last couple of months, everyone's talking about ChatGPT. So this has been quite disruptive in a way that the uh, people are now starting to make use of them, very useful, but also starting to get worried about it. So uh, just to show what ChatGPT is capable of, I just queried uh, ChatGPT uh, about what are the top issues in AI for environmental sustainability. And this is what they come up with. And you know, you can criticize it, you can see, you know, it's where something may not make sense. But generally speaking, that kind of captures lots of the things that we've been talking about and people have been discussing in the environmental sustainability discourse. So that includes uh, not just the technology aspect of it, but uh, also the regulatory and ethical issues uh, that are involved. So this is the kind of technology that we are starting to deal with. And especially in a business discourse and societal discourse, uh, some people are starting to get worried that someday you know, this AI kind of technologies might uh, take over some of our uh, activities. So without being alarmist and not necessarily saying that aligned to the, some, some of these uh, thinkings, but there are some uh, issues which have been um, raised. Uh, for example, there's a book called The Alignment Problem, which basically uh, outlines that the, the, some of the problems caused by misalignment between what the AI is trying to achieve and what humans are trying to achieve. So AI systems are developed to support humans, but sometimes that's implemented in a way that it basically has its own uh, agenda that will satisfy, and that causes misalignment. Uh, there's a thing called the Turing Trap uh, by uh, Ben Yolfson in Stanford, who basically says that the, uh, as machines become better than humans, basically humans are become more like a subservient to machines. So all the intelligent work done by machines and humans are brought down to the place where we are basically serving the machines. And at the same time, some of the large corporations which basically control these uh, technologies will basically be in a position to uh, to fix that uh, value position. So which probably, which will put 
uh, as in a trap, whereby we can never get out of this uh, situation. So uh, there are concerns like that, and Rick Dawson basically argues that we should be talking about augmentation using AI rather than automation, which might cause further problems. And of course, in our popular media, uh, some people say artificial intelligence could lead to extinction. Uh, so some of the you know, so-called godfathers AI have been coming out to warn people about uh, something that might uh, may or may not happen. So, uh, because I've been asked to kind of comment on this a few times, I basically said, okay, so what do people say about the AI risk? So what I did was I went to this place called uh, Safe AI, uh, which basically outlined eight examples of societal risks that are kind of caused by AI. And as you can see, that things like weaponization, misinformation, proxy gaming. Proxy gaming simply means that if we don't have the right optimization or right uh, kind of a loss function that we implement in AI machine learning, we might be actually optimizing in a way that humans may not necessarily do. So that creates a bit of misalignment. Enfeeblement of humans, value locking. So a value will be locked in by large corporations and we lose control there. And also emergent goals, which you never foresee, foresee when we implemented in our, our systems. Deception, parsing behavior, well, they, this might end up uh, damaging society. And if I look at this from a kind of risk management point of view, um, then some of the risks are uh, caused by, you know, it's, some of the designed into it. So uh, something that we are intentionally putting into that, but some of the risks are emergent, and quite a lot of them could be an emergent risk, in, especially in terms of AI, apart from the weaponization, which has to be you know, really intentionally done. And again, looking at my uh, background, I also, uh, okay, so how does this compare to things like nuclear technology, where uh, people sometimes um, are compared? Okay, again, you know, it's very difficult to compare nuclear technology and AI because one is software, often the other one is more of a very hard uh, technology. But uh, there are some so, aspects of design risk as well as emerging risks also associated with uh, nuclear technology as well. So um, if we kind of look at from the risk management point of view, uh, some of the design risks are, say, intentional. Uh, they are often done by malicious actors if they want to uh, cause harm. Uh, there often is no mechanism, so we know why they're doing it, how they're doing it. And uh, as such, it's often manageable, controllable if we have the right approach or regulations in place. And like or not, it's kind of aligned with design goals in a way that uh, even if it's malicious, you know, it's aligned with design goals that it's intended to generate. Um, on the other hand, emerging risks are trickier because they're often unintentional. They're, they didn't plan for that. And after it's not necessarily malicious. They had good intentions, but it's causing kind of wrong effects. And therefore, some of the mechanisms are unknown and emergent. And therefore, it's very sometimes not easy to manage, manage or control. And this is where misalignment to design goals often uh, happens. So, what I'm trying to do is try to make sense of all this and whether we can actually try to, to manage that. And one of the ways to look at it is uh, to treat AI, say, as one of the so called disruptive technologies. And uh, this is a uh, definition um, of this technology, technological innovation that can fundamentally change and establish business models and business uh, rules. So something that basically changed the way we think about things. And uh, so the example I took from is the you know, uh, creative uh, industry, because there's a symposium on our creative industries and AI uh, earlier. So there are some possible futures around use of AI in creative industries. Could be, you know, exploring AI uh, system innovation or machines monopolize creativity. That's how it's scary. Um, and also so different way of thinking that now human may command premium in some of the, even happening in some of the furnitures, handmade furnitures are often more expensive or have a premium compared to factory automated ones. So these might things happen in many of the industries. So what's really needed is try to make sense of all this, why this is happening, and try to kind of realign the so-called business and society and technology at large. So for this purpose, um, I uh, use thing called organizational semiotics. Now, 
Um, I think semiotics is a study of science, so it's all about uh, representation and interpretation and also trying to find meanings, but at the same time appreciate that there are multiple viewpoints because same science can have different meanings according depending on what norms you apply and how you align this uh, sign and object uh, that we took answer. Uh, and so all that was are developed by guy called Ronald Stanford back in the 70s, and he has been applied to uh, analyze, say, organizations and uh, information systems uh, in general. So um, many issues uh, around use of data and information uh, in the actual business use is often caused by, again, misalignment of what is intended to be and um, what's actually formed uh, as, a, as a system. So there are a couple of techniques I have time to introduce. One is called um, organizational container analysis, one's called semiotic framework. So I just go quickly about what how, how this can be specific can be used. So this is called the natural containment model, which basically says that technical systems should be contained within a formal system, which is a more of a bureaucratic system, which is contained within an informal system, which is basically business or society as a whole. So the informal system captures the values and norms, formal system captures the processes and meanings uh, that replace meanings. And technical systems this should be contained in the center. So if we have this containment relationship, everything seems to be happening uh, in a very um, kind of coordinated and aligned way. Now, what happens if it's a bit uh, disruptive system is that it basically goes beyond the boundary of both the formal and informal systems. So that's why it seems disruptive to the to the our societal norms and processes. So Using this kind of analysis, or we can basically to mentally uh, make sense of it, is that there are three ways of dealing with system systems. One is essentially contain it completely so that you, know, you basically say, okay, don't use that technology because you're disrupting the original way of doing things. Our second approach is, to, okay, just change the boundaries of the organizational and you know, informal and formal system so that we contain all that, we accept them in society. Of course, there's a third way of basically trying to manage all those, all those three so that we maintain the containment relationship. So uh, some of the approaches uh, we are uh, seeing uh, is basically uh, uh, making sure that this alignment is maintained. So that's where people person technology paradigm uh, basically uh, aligns quite well with this kind of thinking. And essentially what this is trying to say is that when we design any technical system, we should be thinking it's basically a system of systems. It's not just designed to promote itself and assume that you know everyone will accept it, it will be embedded within the uh, existing systems, but we have to design a social system, formal system at the same time. Otherwise we will break this containment relationship and for consignments. So this is one of the ways to a way of thinking as to ensure uh, the alignment uh, between the three systems and to mitigate some of the emergent uh, risks. Yeah. Now, if I may, um, there's some examples where, again, if this is from nuclear technology, uh, but you can see that the, uh, there is a value system at the very end where the Mickey uh, value, values and norms about safety, security, and peace. And the there's a regulatory framework that surrounds it, mostly internationally and nationally. And some of the technical system has design principles where there's fail safe, there's foolproof, there's a full tolerance kind of idea embedded within technology. So this is quite mature kind of a uh, contemporary relationship. When it comes to AI, we're not really sure yet. So although we're quite uh, about you know, technology and how it's going. But actually, there's no consensus in what is AI and what not AI, and it's only design principles that should be following it. So we're still a bit behind in terms of the regulations, the formal framework part of it. There are EU AI Act, but it's still in, in debate. UK is thinking about more innovative as, aspects uh, approach to regulation, but again, this is still under debate, so there's no consensus there. Uh, but look, some of the uh, the Values and norms and society starting to emerge. Um, you know, the innovation and sort of all this sort of transformation, new opportunities, but also their concerns about ethical and, and safety issues. So uh, again, we're in a kind of situation where these three systems are in the brink of uh, misalignment, but we say, you know, 
uh, say, public dialogue and and uh, well standard uh, flow design, we should be able to achieve this uh, container. Uh, so, just to introduce the semiotic uh, part, so one more. So, I'll just, I'm, I'm close to the time, we'll do this very quickly. Uh, so, uh, something which I'm also be, I've been doing uh, is to try to make sense, make sense of resilience. So, because um, uh, I'm from Japan and being a nuclear uh, engineer, I was very uh, interested, well, concerned, of course, but interested in how uh, the Japan dealt with the Fukushima nuclear accident and how they dealt with it as a, as a society. So um, we, we had a workshop in Tokyo regarding uh, something called community resilience, how we can actually deal with these natural or man-made events uh, and how we can create a resilient society. So for the sake of time, I'll skip a few slides, but one slide. But essentially, uh, we try to make sense of, for me is to again use some idea of some semiotics. So semiotics about meanings, I don't know, intentions and, and society, societal uh, uh, the impacts. So we can analyze the, any technical system using these six levels, starting from the physical level to empirics, to syntactics, semantics, pragmatics, and social. And if I apply this to social resilience, then uh, the physical world are basically something that relates the data and things to reality, even the instrumentation. And the empirics is about assembling these components to meaningful uh, engineering entities, which are basically syntactic, so syntactic elements. But the important part is try to understand it. So what does that mean? What, what is this system actually trying to do? What's the meaning of that? And pragmatics is about what's intended to do. And sometimes this intention is not necessarily shared. And unless this is shared, the societal effects of uh, resilience for self or capacity or distance or adaptation may, may not work. So what we did was use this kind of frame to talk about you know, the, um, the resilience to some major incidents such as nuclear accidents. And uh, we basically mapped it onto uh, you know, six levels of technical components, the so processes, the so infrastructure, <clears throat> but important again part is to understand the processes that go through on top of it. And to have social decision making processes where our communities are involved in making sense and understanding, so that uh, the societal response will be uh, managed uh, as a to, to achieve resilience. So what Again, in summary, what I wanted to do was to introduce uh, the semiotic thinking to, to anyone who's dealing with uh, technological systems, especially with data and information, so that the uh, uh, engineers um, like myself will not go out to simply design things without really not knowing its unintended consequences or not being accepted by society or communities, but at the same time achieve the societal goals uh, that we intend to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying myself to sort of make the connection between what we heard from Alison earlier and yeah. the frameworks, conceptual frameworks, and what we heard from Scott. And I suppose my question to you is, is how do you think this sort of way of thinking would impact on the day-to-day -day work that, that people like Scott and the Turing Institute are doing. Yeah, so I was actually questioning that myself in the last two days. Now, how does that actually impact the natural, the kind of a um, natural environment community, so to say? And uh, maybe at the moment, <clears throat> the, there are more benefits in using AI and technology to basically uh, automate some of the you know, data cleaning activities and some of the, the robotic process that human uh, uh, carrying out. But if we start to depend on more and more AI, and then that especially goes into more the business processes, uh, for example, um, some of the automated solution may be embedded within business, uh, business decision making, then these six assignments may start to emerge. So maybe for this community, maybe still early days, mm -hmm. but once the, this kind of technology matures, uh, then, and then those depend on AI become more uh, significant, then we might have to start thinking in this kind of way, similar to some of the other industries which are ahead of you know, uh, some societal impacts into a discourse. That'd be interesting. 
Uh, we've only got time for like one or two minutes, so it could make it really brief. So, uh, one question. Okay. Thank you. In the, I've seen a few indigenous communities in Nigeria, um, and um, there are some similar issues, like there's some also four companies that came and uh, the part of their sacred areas. Yeah, this some parts of the community, um, the water resources, the stream sites are there. So in that kind of scenario, um, what do you suggest the community to do, or even the person to do? Yeah, uh, I think that kind of situation is where you know you're, you're experts, and there are some people who are. Uh, experts in kind of community participation mm. in decision making, design, co-design in that sense of, of systems. Um, I think the main issue, again, is quite typical uh, technology systems where the end users or people who are supposed to be benefiting the technology are not benefiting from it, either because they're designed for their purpose or because they don't understand why that's done that way. So again, it goes to me, it goes back to a sense making activity, the efforts that to be made in order to engage uh, the various kind of stakeholders uh, in designing systems. So it's a very generic answer, but um, yeah, that's one of the things. Thank you very much. That draws uh, theme four to a close. And I believe it's spotlight.